the meeting as an attendee and will be muted throughout the meeting. We're going to go ahead and call tonight's meeting of the Capitola City Council to order. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Yes, uh, Mayor, can you hear me? The host yeah, would like you to unmute you your microphone. You can press star six to unmute. Well, my bottom you are unmuted. Hello, oh, Mayor, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for your patience. Councilmember Bertrand. Attending. Councilmember Botorf. Here. Councilmember Story. Present. Vice Mayor Brooks. Here. And Mayor Peterson. Here. Thank you. Uh, and before we move, thank you. Before we move forward, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over uh, to you, Chloe, for some information about how uh, people can participate in tonight's meeting. Yes, thank you. Hello and welcome to the council meeting. In accordance with the current Santa Cruz County Health Order and the Governor's Executive Order N2920, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting over Zoom or with your phone is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, on the slides now shown and on the published meeting agenda. That's all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we did roll call, so let's move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. To the flag. To, okay, to the United States. And to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Uh, we are going to move on to presentations. It looks like we have a presentation on Children's Cancer Awareness Month. Hi, my name is Benito Salazar. I work for Jacob Stark Children's Death Support Service. Uh, on behalf of our families and um, our staff, we would like to uh, thank you for uh, for your support um, and would like to proclaim um, September's Childhood Cancer um, Awareness Month. Um, and I want to thank uh, the city of Capitola for supporting us. Great. Thank you, thank you so very much. much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you for bringing that uh, to our awareness. Um, September is Child, uh, Children's Cancer Awareness Month, and we're so glad that you were here to share that with us this evening. Thank you. All right. Um, if there's uh, nothing else on our presentation, uh, we will move forward to uh, item three, additional materials. Is there any additional information uh, for tonight's meeting? There were no additional materials received. Okay, great, thank you. Are there any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? No, I thought there were changes. Okay, uh, now we will go to public comments. Uh, now is the time for any members of the public to address the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda. I'll turn it over to our moderator to let me know if we have any uh, attendees raising their hand or any emails that came in. I do not see any hands raised and I do not see any emails. All right. Thank you. With that, we will move on. Uh, we'll close public comment and move on to city council and staff comments. Let's start with staff. Um, does staff have any comments? I think Nikki, uh, Nikki Bryce has a comment. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. Um, I wanted to let the public know that the Capitola Public Safety and Community Service Foundation is hosting a fundraising campaign in order to raise scholarship funds 
for the um, out-of-school time program that is serving school-age children and working families by providing distance learning um, programs and recreation activities. Um, anybody that is interested in donating to that scholarship fund, they can go to the GoFundMe website and search Capitola Recreation OST, and they will be navigated to the fundraising campaign. Great, thank you so much. Uh, any additional staff comments? Uh, fine. All right, hearing none, we'll bring it back to council. And I see that uh, Vice Mayor Brooks has her hand up for comments. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, unfortunately, the increased visibility of trauma and death at the hands of racial injustice isn't doing as much as it should be. I'd like to encourage all of you to ask yourself, are you an ally of the Black Lives Matters movement, or are you part of the problem? If you think there is not a problem in Capitola or just want to learn more, I would encourage everyone to, um, to attend a community forum being put on by our residents of Capitola. Um, and also I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge just a few of the people that have lost their lives to racism. Eric Gardner, Ezell Ford, Michelle Cusso, Tanisha Anderson, Tamir Wright, Natasha McKenna, Walter Scott, Betty Jones, Philandro Castile, Awesome Jean, Atatiana Jefferson, Eric Reason, Dominique Clayton, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks, for those important comments. And uh, thank you also for your participation, as well as the city manager and the police chief for participating uh, last week in a community conversation about racial justice. It was so important uh, to have you all there. And I received feedback from some of the organizers saying how grateful they were to have uh, our city leadership uh, present at that kind of conversation. So thank you again for bringing that uh, to, to the forefront of our conversation, Vice Mayor Brooks. Uh, I don't see any other hands up. Okay. Seeing none, we're going to go ahead and uh, close our council comments and bring it to our consent calendar. All the items on tonight's consent calendar will be enacted by one motion in the form listed uh, on the agenda. Uh, unless any member of the public or any uh, city council member wants to uh, remove an item for separate consideration. And it looks like council member Bertrand, do you have your hand up? Do you want to remove an item? No, I just have a simple question. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess, Jamie, this is addressed to you or whomever is appropriate on your staff. Item 7D, dealing with the ju uh, grand jury response in terms of risk and uh, preparedness. So if you can't answer, that's fine. But I noticed many, well, first of all, that whole missive was quite interesting. And um, I need to go over a little bit more. But Many of the responses had to do with, you know, the things that were brought up, I think, were fairly decent in terms of risk management and preparing for things that may be a risk in terms of our revenue, for instance. Um, and we don't have the staff and the time and the bandwidth, and I totally understand that. Um, is there any effort that the county is doing that we could be a part of, or, you know, maybe that could be brought up at the mayor's committee uh, when you meet because you know this I think is a broader function not just something that can be adequately done for our small town which is the smallest in, in Santa Cruz so so I'm happy to respond but before I do I think I'll just ask the mayor do you, do you want me to just respond or would you like a little bit of a staff explanation do you want to move on the rest of consent and then how do I do it you? later yeah <laughs> let's um Let's go, let's go ahead and um, get the answer to this, this question just briefly, and then we can, can move forward. Um, but I do want to clarify, I don't, I don't have the mayor, there is no mayor's committee on risk preparedness. Well, no, uh, just the normal one during the year where you bring up subjects for the county and, and anyone else to oh, address uh, that, that mayor's committee. The selection committee. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
thank you. Yeah, um, uh, City Manager Goldstein, if you could just briefly respond to that, uh, and then we can, can move forward. Sure. So very quickly, the grand juries are groups of citizens that are paneled to look into operations for government operations for um, evidence of fraud or uh, improper use of public funds. And so our current grand jury was impaneled and they wrote a report entitled um, Managers of Risk or Victims of Risk, Rocked by the Shocks. And this report was directed to all the cities in in Santa Cruz County as well as the county. And you know, I'm not gonna do too much effort to try to summarize what they're finding, but basically, loosely, they were um, critical of the level of, of sort of risk analysis that jurisdictions were doing and suggested that some of the models used by the federal government could be employed here. So there were a number of responses that the city of Capitola had to reply to um, and suggestions. and so. My staff worked with staff in the other jurisdictions on, prep, on preparing a response to make sure that we were all kind of looking at this in a similar way. And, um, and so that, that is, we did coordinate with the county and the other cities on the responses. Um, but I think more specifically, if you have a specific question, Councilmember Bertrand, I could actually address it if it was focused on one of the specific findings. Well, the way I look at it is, in a sense, we're all in the same bucket, you know. Whatever hits Capitola is going to hit Watsonville, you know, Santa Cruz County, Santa Cruz City, all of us, all of this area. So it seems to me, in terms of risk management, um, we could get some direction from the from a county effort. Um, Councilmember Bertrand, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. I just I'm looking at the agenda, and, and we're supposed to uh, any items that are pulled for separate discussion need to be considered following general government. And so if it was just a quick response you were looking from the city manager, we can get that now. But if you want a, f a further dialogue or conversation about how we can partner with the county, we're gonna need to move that to the end of our agenda. Well, that's fine. My question basically, I was trying to phrase it, is I'm wondering if the county has any effort like that or plan to do that. And then if they don't, maybe it could be brought up at the mayor's selection committee and oh, okay. approached as a subject. Okay. Yeah, we will definitely find out about that. Okay, that's fine with me. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, okay, with that, uh, we will uh, entertain a motion for our consent calendar. So move. Moved by Council Member Bertrand, do we have a second? A second. Seconded by Council Member Story. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Batorf. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on now to item eight, uh, general government and public hearings, and we'll start with 8A, uh, budget update. And I'll turn it over to staff. Again, good evening, Mayor and Council. So as the mayor just mentioned, this is going to be a fiscal year 1920 year end budget update. And then from this budget update, we'll also have a couple of staff recommendations for budget amendments in fiscal year 2021, which I'll cover and then summarize at the end. So let me share my screen with you. Can everybody see that okay? They're not sharing. Not sharing. Yeah, I don't see anything. Where's Larry? What we need? I'm right here. If you're having trouble, you want me to just, I can put it on my screen. Yeah, if you don't mind. Right. For you, absolutely. Right. Yep. Give me one sec. I think I might have it now. Okay. Is that better? Nope. What is going on? All right, technology. Here we go. Okay. All right. Oh, wait, we got. <laughs> there we go. How does that look, 
folks? Looks good. Okay. So uh, I guess you'll have to move the slides for me, Jamie. I will. Okay, let's get started. So uh, first I'm just going to go over a quick timeline. As you're all aware, our fiscal year runs July 1st through June 30th, and we break those fiscal years down into four quarters. So uh, first I'll start with fiscal year 1920, quarter three. If you all remember, in uh, the third quarter, March 16th, the shelter in place orders were issued, um, which was basically just the last two weeks of that quarter. We didn't really know what the uh, impact would be to sales tax until May 20th, which is important if you go to the next slide, because we are working on our 2021 budget preparation and adoption. So we get the amount that we're going to get on May 20th. We don't actually get the data behind it and analyzed by our consultant until generally five to six weeks later. So we're in budget preparation and adoption without really knowing the details of the third quarter sales tax and have zero information on Q4, which is typical, but a little more challenging when you're in a um, global pandemic. Next slide. On Q4, which runs April through June, uh, May 1st, we began reopening some of the businesses that had been shut down. But again, we don't really know what the impact is on the sales tax front, which is 50% of our general fund revenue until August 20th. So we just got that data a couple of weeks ago, which kind of led to this meeting. Next slide. And then um, Q1, which began the, the fiscal year, early July, some of those shelter in place restrictions were put back in place. Again, we won't get our sales tax number until November 20th, and we won't even really have an analysis of that data until probably, if we're lucky, late December, but with holidays more than likely early January, which is important because if you recall, we entered into some labor concessions and those are set to expire on December 26th. And we won't know what our Q2 sales tax number is until February 20th. So the plan right now is we'll get the number in no, late November and then they be back before council in early to mid-December and review that as we prepare for kind of December 26th and, and how we get ready for our mid-year budget. Next slide, please. So by way of background, when uh, at the onset of COVID-19, we made some major revenue uh, projections or reduced revenue projections to these four were the primary, it was across the board, but these were the four primary revenues that we were looking at that we thought would be impacted. So as you can see on uh, the first one, sales tax, we had reduced that budget by 50% for the fourth quarter of 1920, and then 21% for the entire fiscal year of 2021. TOT, 95% in the fourth quarter, 71% in this fiscal year. Recreation, 95% in the fourth quarter, 25% in 21. And parking, 50% both in the fourth quarter as well as this fiscal year. In addition, in order to, to get some of the savings that we needed, uh, we had six vacant positions when that, for soon to be vacant positions, when that shelter for shelter in place order came out on March 16th. And so we froze those six positions. We then entered into negotiations seeking employee concessions. And during that time, we had three additional positions that were vacated. And I'll touch on those a little bit later. And then since the beginning of this fiscal year, we've had one resignation and we've been notified of two potential retirements. So I'm going to go through each of those four revenues. And just to kind of give you the format, I'm going to have the adopted fourth quarter budget amount what our assumption was, and then compare that to what our actual receipts were. And then I'll go through the uh, 2021 budget, the budget amount for those four revenues, what our assumption was, and then recommended changes, if any, to those uh, projections. So first, uh, sales tax. Our adopted fourth quarter budget was just under $2 million. We reduced that by 50%, so just under a million dollars. Actual receipts actually came in at 1.7 million, a little over, but it included $362,000 of one-time payment, or not one-time, sorry, uh, prior period adjustments, which we always have prior period adjustments. It's just that's much larger than what we normally get. 
we believe that three hundred of the three sixty two hundred thousand three hundred sixty thousand is one time payments related to the deferral program that the state implemented so we will be meeting with our sales tax consultant and see if that's actually what it is but we're pretty confident that that's what that is so that if we adjust our revenue it's down to a little over 1.4 million which represents a 29 percent reduction so still much better than the 50 percent that we were originally projecting for fiscal year 2021 our annual budget was is 6.3 million a little over 6.3 million which is a 21 percent reduction so not quite the 29 but we're starting to see some better performance so these these reductions in the fourth quarter are for the really are from the middle of March through June 30th and what we saw was big reductions early sales tax not as much the other revenues we did and then they started to bounce back a little bit as we got into June July and now into August so again we will be meeting with our sales tax consultant that first week of October going through all that data and confirming if that three thousand dollar is actually one-time payments as we suspect or we're going to see prior period adjustments as we continue on through the shelter in place orders so because of that there's no budget amendment recommended at this time for our sales tax revenue the next revenue is the TOT our adopted fourth quarter budget was a little over 410,000 that one we reduced by 95 percent down to 20,508 actual receipts were a little over 119,000 which represented a 71 percent reduction so again that that one we really saw where it it took a hard hit in March and April and then started coming back a little bit in May a little better in June and July and August we're actually only down about 30 percent August I'm not 100 percent sure but I've checked with a couple of our operators and they're down about 30 percent so our adopted fiscal year 2021 annual budget was 475.8 which was a 71 percent reduction but again a lot of that 71 percent in the fourth quarter happened early on during the first six to eight weeks so our revenues are really outpacing the projection of 71 percent of a reduction so for that reason we're recommending two budget amendments the first is to increase TOT revenue by 344,529 that would take us to 50 percent of what our adopted budget was in the prior year and that would increase general fund revenue TOT revenue by just under 321,000 and then on the restricted TOT 12,600 for local business groups and 11,000 for early childhood and youth programs and with that 11,000 for the early childhood and youth programs we're recommending a budget amendment to increase the outside of school time scholarship program by $11,000 if you recall we budgeted I believe 14,500 and we have already given out that entire amount of scholarships and we still have a need for more which is the reason for this recommendation on the recreation fee side adopted fourth quarter budget was 269,000 we cut that by 95 percent down to just under 13,500 we had receipts of 28,000 which was a 90 percent reduction that excess revenue basically just kind of offset expenditures a lot of what we were doing with junior guards and camp that started in in June so a little bit of hit in June but a lot more of that activity that we saw the revenues are actually in this fiscal year so our adopted fiscal year 2021 budget is 507 225 as far as recreation revenues which is a 25 percent reduction from prior year so far year to date as I mentioned a lot of that revenue that we saw from the junior guards and the camp program that took place is in this year so right now or through July we had or August I'm sorry we had $162,000 of revenue offset by $160,000 of expenditures so this is when we want to continue to watch and for that reason no budget amendment recommended at this time on recreation side for the fees and then parking revenue our adopted budget for the fourth quarter was 274,418 again cut that one in half down to 137 actual receipts were 114,609 which was a 58 percent reduction but again those were those were looking better toward in the later months like June, July and August than they were early on 
Um, so that 58%, again, it's kind of spread out over that period. I believe, I believe if I remember correctly, July was only down about 35%. Um, adopted budget for, for parking revenues was 428,963 for this fiscal year, which was a 50% reduction from prior year. Again, we had seen improvement coming in, so I think the 58% that we saw in the fourth quarter is still a little bit on the high side. We saw improvement prior to the fire. Um, that may have come down a little in August, but they were performing pretty well towards right before the fire. So um, fiscal year revenues to date are only down 48%. So since we were at 50%, this is one that we want to continue to watch for the next couple of months and then discuss again when we come back to council in December. So no budget amendment recommended um, parking revenue at this time. From the staffing perspective, um, again, at the onset of COVID-19, we, we froze the 6% uh, positions that were vacant. Again, there's three additional vacancies that, that came up during those uh, labor negotiations. However, savings from all nine vacancies were utilized when we prepared the 2021 budget. Um, since July 1st, we've had the potential for three additional vacancies. Those include a police officer, parking enforcement officer, and senior mechanic. Those three positions are funded, fully funded in the 2021 budget. And the recommendation from staff is to fill the three positions. The police officer is actually vacant now. So we'd like to start on that one immediately as they're already down another officer and a sergeant from the uh, sworn side. And then the parking enforcement officer and senior mechanic as those retirements are finalized. On the staff training side, if you recall, we cut all non-reimbursable department training budgets were eliminated. So really the only thing we left in there from a training perspective was for um, the post training with police officers. So police officers are continuing with their training, but that's because it's reimbursable through the post program. However, we do have um, a city clerk and building inspector positions are filled by new employees. that didn't complete what, what would be their normal training when they come into those positions. So we're recommending a budget amendment for $11,000 for those two employees to continue their, their on-the-job training programs. And I'll break that out. I have a summary um, in a couple of slides, and I'll break that $11,000 out between the two positions. And then this is just for uh, folks that are a little more visual. This is our org chart. And the boxes that you have up there in red are the frozen positions. And then for the police officer, there's actually the box around police officers has two positions, one frozen and one vacant. And then the boxes that are in blue, parking enforcement officer and senior mechanic are the two pending retirements. So just to kind of give more of an illustrative look to that. On the CARES Act, um, when we were doing the budget preparation, we didn't really have any information on CARES Act funding as far as what what was going to be available to Capitola and what were the parameters as far as um, getting that money. So since the beginning of this fiscal year, we've now been allocated $124,805. They're paying it in monthly installments, which started in July. So we have our first two installments have come in. And um, we also learned that public safety salaries and benefits are considered reimbursable. So last week I had to submit our first um, CARES Act funding report, which covered March through June, and our public safety salary and benefit costs, as you can see there, 424.5 far exceeds the 124.805. So we're, we're confident now that we won't have to return any of that money that we're fully qualified for reimbursement. Hopefully, there'll be another round, but I don't really have any solid information on that. But because of this, this right here, um, if you go to the next slide, staff's recommending two additional budget amendments. The first is to increase the grant revenue by 124,805, since that's now really a solid number. And then on the expenditure side, increase janitorial services budget by 10,000. If uh, that's approved, that'll take our janitorial services budget to 32,000, which is about 70% of what we traditionally budget for that category. Can I add the, the purpose behind the janitorial um, uh, service expansion is really to enhance cleaning the public restrooms um, and the intent behind that is it frees up our public works crews who are 
short staffs, and on top of that, we, we aren't using our summer seasonal help that we usually use. So it'll free them up to do a lot more of the winter preparations that we typically do. So it's a relatively limited investment that we see addresses um, addresses some of the issues that we've seen with all the cuts that we've had this, this summer. Back to you, Jim. So this is the um, summary of the budget amendment. So on the general fund revenue side, uh, you see the federal grants increased by the 124,805. Uh, TOT revenue that would go to the general fund just under 321,000. And then the T restricted TOT revenue is 11,000 for early childhood and youth programs, 12,600 to local business groups. On the expenditure side, uh, city manager training, which is for the city clerk position, 6,000. The janitorial services that uh, Jamie just talked about for 10,000. Uh, CED or community development department training for the building inspector position. And then the 11,000 for the uh, recreation OSD program on the scholarships. Um, so fiscal impact, <clears throat> excuse me, from these budget amendments would increase general fund revenues by 445, 734. Expenditures would increase by 32,000. And then if you remember, um, the adopted budget that we're operating under right now is actually drawing just under $100,000 out of fund balance. These budget amendments would then structurally balance our budget and have revenues exceeding expenditures by around 314,000, which would lead to an estimated ending fund balance at June 30th of 21 of 993,000. Now, <clears throat> again, we're gonna come back in December and have, I think, some more discussions on that fund balance. But at this point, staff's thought was with still so many moving pieces going on that um, we didn't want to kind of overextend ourselves and then try to retract, which is why we didn't really dip into that. On the restricted TOT uh, fiscal impacts, increased revenue of 23,600 with, again, 12,600 for local business groups, 11,000 for early childhood youth programs, and then increasing the OST scholarship expenditures from 11,000 up to 25,000. Oh. For um, public comment. So, oh, go ahead. I think this would conclude, right? The presentation. Yeah, I, had the, I just had the public comment and then the recommended action. That the only okay. Thing. The public comment will come after council questions. So, yeah. so that. Questions. All right, thank you so much. And it looks like we do have uh, Vice Mayor Brooks and then Council Member Bosworth with some questions. So let's start uh, with Vice Mayor Brooks. Thanks, Mayor Peterson. Just a quick question on um, page 229 of the staff report. There's mention of the two trainings associated with the staff. And it looks like there's mention of a 5,000 and 6,000. Can you talk? Uh, a little bit about that? Yeah, so the um, $6,000 is the city clerk position, and uh, we that number is derived from what we have done in the past for on-site, in-person training. If this training moves forward, more than likely it would be virtual, and I don't think we would require the full 6000 but if something changes between now, I think the first session is a little later this year or early next year, if something changes before then and they do live in-person training, we at least have the proper budget in amount. And then the 5,000 is for the building inspector and community development department. And that is also based on uh, previous trainings that we've done with um, other employees that have uh, occupied those positions previously. When, when are the trainings taking place? This City clerk, if I remember correctly, is in the spring, possibly late winter, early spring, and with the first session, and then there's a second session, I believe, in late May or early June. On the building inspector, I do not know exactly when that is. So my question is, if we're going to come back in December, it, what's the purpose of bringing this forward now with such? I mean, six thousand dollars is pretty significant if no one's traveling any longer. I'm just wondering why this is being brought now. Why don't I, why don't I take that question? So the reason why we were recommending was simply because we're sort of developed, you know, one thing 
people make plans relatively far in advance. Um, and I also wanted to signal to these employees that the training that they normally would be getting is back on track. Um, I agree that the figure looks quite high, particularly for the city clerk training, where really what we're talking about is probably going to be um, virtual training opportunities. So frankly, it was more, if anything, to signal to the employees so that they knew that they could plan on that and that we were committed to that position. Um, but you're right, we don't need to have funding, I don't believe, until we, we could do it at the December date. Thank you. All right, we'll go to Council Member Bothwark and then Council Member Bertrand. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I guess I'll direct this towards the city manager. Uh, it looks like uh, the, the TOT and the sales tax were depressed, but uh, the most robust form of revenue was the parking, uh, it appears. And I'm just trying to think if the only reason that it was down, or if you think that the reason, the question is, do you think the reason it's down is because we're missing 40 to 50 prime time places and you know would, would that if those if there is there any kind of analysis that you have that if those places per space how would that fit into what we would consider a normal budget allocation so overall when we looked at parking revenue as jim presented it it was 58 percent reduced during the fourth quarter last year so that's may april may june and so far this year, we're running 48% down. During the April, May, June period, remember we had the upper and lower lots closed. It was shelter in place. Things were just really quiet. So I would attribute, I think that what we're seeing now with the 48% reduction, my guess is um, a decent chunk of that is being driven by the loss of spaces for the outdoor dining. Uh, in general, those spaces, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Public Works Director Jesper, about $2,000 a space is what they generate on an annual basis, those ones on the Esplanade right there. We can do some further analysis and, and bring it back to Council the next time around. Um, but I think that without a doubt, the loss of those spaces we're seeing in the revenue for sure. And Steve, if you have anything to add, please. Yeah, I think it's about $2,400 a space, so you're, you're pretty accurate there. And we're, I think the number of spaces that we lost is about 50 spaces um, down along the ocean. So that's, that's a good, good chunk of the spaces in the village. And I would speculate that not, it's probably not a one-for-one -one loss. You know, that at some point those spaces were just, people were displaced and moved somewhere else. But the question is, were they moved into the Swenson lot? And creating it, you know, money for him and not for the city, or moved into Back Cove, which probably has some traffic benefits for the city, but just you know, in terms of meter rates, it's um, you know, 30, 33 percent less, I think, than the upper and lower lots. Thank you. All right, and then Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, thank you. I was going to ask a similar question, and. Um, the second question I'm going to ask, because Ed sort of asked it, is this normal uh, of revenue, is what we're seeing right now reflective of that, or is it pretty much an overlay of what we've been seeing from the pandemic and everything else? Are there any normal trends that are starting to reappear? That's basically the question. Um, uh, go ahead, Jamie. No, no. Well, so what I'm starting to see, it appears that TOT is, is um, coming back and leveling off a little bit. Um, it could be if the, the fire and all the evacuees and everybody, you know, kind of saying way may, may impact us a little bit. We didn't, doesn't appear to be that much. Um, sales tax, I, it, it dropped off kind of quick and then, but not very far, and it seems to be kind of pretty stable over the last few months, um, below what we normally would get, but fairly stable, but close to what our projections were for this fiscal year. The, the parking, again, it, it dropped off really early, but like Jamie said, in the first couple of months when everything was really quiet and there was nobody here, everything was shut down. But those have really kind of leveled off as well and seem to be operating close to that 50% projection at the end. 
Okay, a little follow-up. Um, we do have a marijuana provider up near uh, Pizza My Heart, and the question there is, what is their uh, performance? And then uh, the second one, they're still remodeling. Do we have any sense of when that's going to open and give us some more revenue? So the, um, the first one that opened up there behind Peace of My Heart at the Hook seems to be pretty consistent over the last couple of months, um, not generating quite as much as, as we thought it would, but it, it's consistent and, and seems to be slowly building, although this last month was a little bit down. Uh, the other one on 41st is going to be called Deep Thought, I believe, and they just inquired with me uh, this week about getting the forms and and getting prepared to submit, or at least getting all of the process to submit their cannabis tax. So I'm, based on that, I'm assuming they're gonna open in relatively short time, but I don't have a timeline on that. Okay, so I'm just wondering if we're on track for the projections there, you know, because one didn't open and one did, but it's not performing as well as we thought. So sure. do we need to adjust? This, this budget um, anticipated that the second shop wouldn't open up until sometime during the second quarter of the okay. fiscal year. So if, if that happens relatively soon, then we'll probably be pretty close. If they're delayed past the first of the year, then we're going to have to probably make some adjustments. Okay. And I was wondering if you'd give a little explanation. Um, I didn't know that our uh, uh, police, et cetera, would be paid for by the CARES Act. And does that include the OT that we provided for people that um, went and helped out in the CZU fires? So, so the CARES Act is really for uh, the COVID-19. For everything that we did as far as mutual aid on the uh, CZU lightning complex fire, we've tracked all of that time. I've been working with uh, Sergeant Ryan down there to get all of that tracked. Now I need to go back to the county now that things are starting to settle down and figure out what is our process to get reimbursed. But my understanding is all of the overtime will be reimbursed. That's great. So we, during that time we were fully covered. I don't know how many people we provided. Maybe we could talk about that. Um, I'll, I'll have the chief chime in. What I remember is uh, I believe we had four officers rotating, two in the morning, two in the evening. But I'll let the uh, chief get into that. So don't want to step into police operations. Okay, thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> you're correct, uh, Jim, Councilmember Bertrand. Uh, two officers, uh, day shift, two officers, evening shift, working 12-hour shifts, and that mutual aid ended officially uh, this Monday, this past Monday. Okay, thanks. And what, what shift was the officer that we're going to need to replace um, covering? Evening shift. Evening. Okay. Normally we have two, correct? That's correct. And I'm staffing is two. So if we don't replace that, we'll only have one. No. Well, well we're one body down. We make adjustments yeah. on our schedule. You'll make adjustments. Yeah. Okay. Got it. I just want to make sure I understood what we're talking about. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Thank you. Any additional uh, questions from comment? Uh, questions from Council? Seeing none, we will go to uh, public comment. Now I'll turn it over to our moderator to see if there's any public comment on this item. I don't see any attendees and I don't see any emails. All right, with that, we will bring it back. Any comments from council members? And if not, we will uh, entertain a motion and go to a vote. Do we have any motion? Is there a, there's a motion on this, right? Yeah, the recommended action is up on the screen. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I'll move staff recommendation. I'll second. Okay, moved by Council Member Story, seconded by Council Member Bosworth. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Bottorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, carries unanimously. Uh, we'll move on now to item 8B uh, regarding a code of conduct for council, city council and commissioners. All right. 
So Vice Mayor Brooks or Council Member Story, do one of you guys want to kick this one off for us? Sure, I'll be more than happy to do that. Uh -huh. Thank you, Sam, um, for giving me that, giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of both of us. Jamie, if you don't mind pulling up the slides again so I could read the first um, sure. slide. And then we will get to slideshow from the beginning. Why does it always do this way? All right, I'll let you get going. Well, I just want to first say thank you again to Council Member Story for participating in the subcommittee on the Code of Conduct um, for members. Um, you met on January 23rd. I'm just going to minimize my screen here. On January 23rd, City Council held a hearing regarding developing a code of conduct for Capitola. Shortly thereafter, Council formed a ad hoc subcommittee um, consisting of myself and Council Member Story. The ad hoc sub um, subcommittee met with staff, and again, I want to thank the staff and our City Attorney Samantha for participating to review um, some of the different options that other cities have uh, put together and for their for their code of conduct so we reviewed those examples and we created a draft for capitola um, the code of conduct included is, is in your packet today um, and it is recommended by both uh, both myself and council member story oh and then jamie has so much <coughs> more to present about what it is we have several more slides all right. So I was just going to briefly touch on what is here in the code of conduct. I think more than anything, um, you know, I think what I'd really like the council to appreciate is this, this is going to be your document. You know, this is intended to be a document that's going to, you're, you're, you're imposing on yourself to regulate, to normalize behavior, to make it clear what expectations are and how you would deal with issues of violations of that. And so, um, it's a little bit awkward for me to sort of be proposing this, but nevertheless, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to quickly walk through it. And I think the best format would be if there's any questions we could, um, between myself, uh, the attorney Zutler, or um, Council Member Story, or Vice Mayor Brooks, one of us would give our best to answer it. So the key thing to remember here is, is that nothing here is replacing any law. All the laws about uh, conflict of interest, open meetings, all of those things, they still apply. Um, really what this is intended to be is, is a framework for how council members want um, to work as a group and if there's violations of that code of conduct, how they would be considered. I mean, I think those are kind of the key things to think about. Um, the code of conduct I, as recommended has, I think that's something like eight different, seven, six different sections, uh, core values, transparency and decision-making standards, um, how council members are supposed to interact with each other and city staff and other appointed officials, um, relation, standards for relations between council members and how they behave at meetings, um, how they communicate with other public boards and agencies, um, and then how to investigate violations of these standards. So touching a little bit more deeply into the core values, this is something that many other codes of conduct that we looked at had in them. And what we did was we went through a couple of other examples and then it ended up organizing them into these four key areas, which is responsibility, integrity, respect and value for others, and then accountability. The next section in the code of conduct is transparency and decision making. Um, and that really focuses primarily on kind of really making it clear that the Brown Act applies. I think the only sort of key thing in here is, is making it clear that closed closed session discussions, closed session materials, that stays in the closed session. Fairness of process. Uh, we have sections talking about the council members make decisions based on the merits, um, that they would disclose information that they that that other council members may not have. Uh, so in particular, this is an issue around quasi judicial hearings, which is when you are weighing in on issuing a permit, for example, or someone's appeal of a decision that is very important to remain neutral and to disclose any information that may not be readily available to your other peers. Um, 
the other things in the peer fairness process about thinking about things from all sides and ensuring that we give people fair hearings, that we are maintain proper decorum and that we're attentive during our meetings. The next session talks about ethical decision making, um, really kind of focused on, on making sure that, that your decisions are, you're following FTPC advice, you're getting FTPC advice, and there's times when maybe just for reasons that maybe not be purely FTPC related, you may need to step away just because of the appearance of potential conflicts. The second, the ethical principles to follow, these are, this is a little bit of a catch-all. Um, and these were, these were things that we saw in other people's codes of conduct and sometimes they seem to be related to particular issues that cities had. Uh, one city had a great deal of information in their code of conduct about city stationery, for example. But we pulled these things in here, uh, talking about avoiding personal interest, no personal gain, using city stationery only for city business. Um, members of members uh, would not appear in front of city council or another body representing private interest and then refraining from accepting gifts or favors that might compromise your independence down the road. Efficiency and accountability. Um, I think a lot of the, the first key here is, is sort of respecting the council manager form of government. Uh, so the direction and is given to me or the city attorney and it's uh, our job to implement that. Uh, we talk about interactions with members of the public, talking about, oh, sorry, interaction with members. So we're talking about the positions of mayor, pro tem mayor, um, the mayor's role during the meetings, uh, and the mayor's role as a spokesman for the city. I think the one area where we probably had the most interesting conversation was around enforcement. Um, and I would say that in most of the codes of conduct we looked at, they kind of punted on this issue. Um, I think that the, the, frame, the, the phrase that we saw in a lot of different codes of conduct were that the intent of these codes is for them to be self-enforcing. And that was it. And I think uh, many of you followed uh, uh, jurisdiction, another jurisdiction in this county who went through some real challenges around codes of conduct and council member relations and, and the process of how to adjudicate uh, differences of opinion, particularly around these sort of code of conduct issues, is really is very challenging for cities. And so what we really focused on, the subcommittee focused on, was trying to put down on paper how, how it would be dealt with. And basically, it, to summarize, what we ended up coming up with is that if complaints are made, it comes to me and the city attorney, and the city attorney would then uh, make a determination whether or not there's a potential violation of the law. And if there's a violation of the law, identify what path that investigation or um, what would be the appropriate next step to take. If it's a violation of this code of conduct uh, in and of itself, at that point, then it would be forwarded to the city council and the city council would then make a determination in open session about what the next step is, whether to order an investigation or to um, take further action. And then lastly, the, the code of conduct includes basically three types of um, penalties, if you will, starting at the bottom censor, which was considered sort of the least, um, the least formal type of reprimand, or sorry, the worst, <laughs> least formal type of penalty that could be imposed. Um, excuse me, I'm backwards. Reprimand is the least formal uh, type of penalty. It can be either verbal or written. Censor is a more formal statement of displeasure. It often would be accompanied by removing a council member from their position uh, on appointed boards and commissions. Council members don't have the ability to remove a council member from city council. And then the most, the highest level of, um, of uh, repercussion would be dismissal. And that is not, doesn't, wouldn't apply to council members, but it would apply to other city officials to be removed from their, their office. 
either it would be pursuant to the muni code which is how we deal with the uh, planning commission we have explicit language in the muni code about how a planning commissioner could be removed or other boards and commissioners who really serve in the councilman council's uh, pleasure so code of conduct also includes several important appendices that outline um really help people i think understand some of the framework for kind of the undergirding if you will of um of of uh, California law that applies in this situation and then we also had a signature page where people new council members as they come on board and this council would all sign and acknowledge that they've read received and intend to abide by the codes of the code of conduct so with that I'm available for questions um, council member Brooks or council member story do you have anything to add uh, yeah, Jamie, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a clarification. If you go back to that slide on under determination, and just to, to clarify um, that actually under determination, the, the, the dismissal refers to the dismissal of the complaint, um, not of the, of the complaintee. Um, and then the next level was reprimand, and Jamie uh, um, described that accurately. And final, it's censure. Um, so those were the levels of determination. Um, and um, and then removal of uh, of any commissioners and um, board members was uh, the separate section, as Jamie mentioned. And I, I just wanted to make one that um, uh, clarification. Um, and also just to uh, thank all the staff, um, Jamie um, and Larry and Sam um, uh, that assisted us and putting to get, going through a lot of material and, and several drafts of this code of conduct and also want to extend my appreciation to Vice Mayor Brooks for participating and, and actually bringing, she was the, I think the leader in bringing this um, before us. Uh, so thank you to all of you and uh, for allowing me to participate and present this code of conduct. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Story. Uh, it looks like Council Member Bertrand has a question. Yeah, I have um, two areas of concern that I have questions about. One is accepting gifts, services, and other special considerations. Um, so I'm sure the answer is I can do this. And if I, I get a, a free comp ticket to go to a, an event, like the one around here is the Monterey Economic Forum. Um, that's not considered, I believe, for personal. So is that an issue? Just well, one clarification. Let's take a look at our code of conduct. Yeah. <laughs> and see what? So the language in your code of conduct says members will refrain from accepting gifts, favors, or promises of future benefits that might compromise their independence or the appearance that they're independent and, and unbiased. So to the extent that a nonprofit is willing to give you a entry into a conference that they're putting on, I think it would depend on the situation. Does the nonprofit seek funding from the city? If the nonprofit doesn't seek funding from the city, I think my answer would probably be they're not. You're, you're getting you're getting a gift. It's under the FPPC limit, and there's no potential for you're not compromising your independence. Um, if they do ex look for money from the city, then I might think twice about something like that. Uh, city Attorney Zeller, do you have anything other perspective? No, I I would say the same, except to add that it was really. If it were an issue, it would be a decision for your fellow council members. And so when you think about whether to accept it, you might think about it through that lens. Yeah, because I usually go to these conferences to get information about a subject. And, you know, it's not necessarily to be influenced. But um, so you're suggesting saying it up and then let the city council determine that. I'm sorry, you cut out. Can you repeat that? Yeah. 
so i usually go to conferences to get information to be educated basically um so you're suggesting if there seems to be an issue as jamie suggested for a group that wants to get a donation or funding or whatever uh, bring that up to city council and have them make a vote on that no because then you would well you could and you would need to agendize the item and have it on the have it be discussed at a council meeting i would assume that if every council member did that um you might bog down your meeting and so my suggestion was when you're thinking about whether or not to accept it you should consider what your other stuff what your fellow council members might say and what you might say if another council member accepted the same my guess is just like city manager goldstein said if it is a nonprofit that does not request money from the city it's probably fine um if they do request money you probably want to consider that generally um what you're describing to me sounds like it's probably fine but again these are this document is the council document and so city manager both seems in my interpretation of the document is not nearly as important as the interpretation by your fellow council members okay got it um my second question deals with the um the concept that we should be in closed session and respect closed session and not share that information with anyone else in the public um is this following a california state law or is this just a practice yes that is state law okay so if it is state law is there a recourse other than what we agreed to here if you have proof or a pretty good idea that someone did uh breach that it's a misdemeanor to disclose information from closed session so it would be up to the district attorney about whether or not to prosecute it okay so how would you proceed in a case like that i i worry that we're getting a bit off topic here um and so i want to make sure that we're observing the brown act and discussing our rules for applying the brown act uh but briefly i'll, I'll tell you if a brown act violation if an allegation of a brown act violation came to me um i would discuss with the city manager the best way to deal with it and if it involves a specific council member i might discuss that with a specific council member okay thank you i asked a question because i want to understand how this code of conduct um conduct works so in voting for it it's important for me to understand actually how it works if there's actually mechanisms to enforce what we want to do in certain certain circumstances that's the reason why I asked the question. That's it. All right, thank you council member Breton. Any additional questions from council members? I just have one brief question. Um the, if, can we pull the slides back up? I, I want to make sure I'm I'm uh referencing the correct information. I think it was the next one. There was a, um, or, or we can look at the slides. Mm, well, basically, there was uh, a, a suggestion that if there's any non-criminal, if there's a complaint that's determined to be non-criminal or non-legal in nature, um, that there will be an investigation. Um, who does that investigation? So, so, so the, the the determination first is whether or not it's a violation of the law. Right. Uh, and if it's a violation of the law, uh, the city attorney would determine the appropriate path. Right. A viol violation of the law, that could mean potentially um, an allegation such as uh, Council Member Bertrand brought up as, you know, closed session material was being leaked. It could be allegations that someone accepting money in some way. Right. And things like that. If it's none of those things, Really what it is, is, you know, we have language in here that says that council members will ensure that the meetings are held in a fair and equitable manner, be civil, civil, polite, and respectful. If that's what the allegation is, it's really kind of beyond anything that as a city manager or city attorney, we, we could adjudicate or really say what process to follow. So at that point, we would work with the mayor we would put it on the agenda for the council to decide and the council would have some choices they could say there's nothing here they could say we would like to order an investigation of this matter um 
or they could render a decision then and there. So that's my question right there. If the council says we want to order an investigation of this matter, who does that investigation? So I can answer that. Whoever you'd like to do the investigation, usually investigate. There's a whole bunch of employment, employer investigators. There's a whole cadre of them out there. I actually do investigations for other clients. And so if you were interested in having an investigation done, I could work with the city manager and find you an investigator. Okay, cool. Just curious. Thank you so much. Or actually, let me add to that. Sometimes, depending on the nature of the allegation, sometimes the police department might be able to do the investigation. Got it. Great. Thank you. All right. With that, we will bring this to public comment. Are there any members of the public that would like to address the council on this item? I do not see any attendees with hands up, and I do not see any emails. All right. With that, we'll bring it back to council for a discussion and a motion and a vote. Any discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. Council member Bertrand. Yeah. I'm glad this was brought forward. And, you know, I think that if we had anything before, I wasn't really aware of it. This is pretty comprehensive, and I appreciate staff working with our council and everyone else putting this together. It's definitely a good argument that this is missing. Obviously, we need to work together, and anything that detracts from that, I think, is going to detract heavily from our effectiveness as a city council. So, to me, that's the main basis for this. We're trying to create something so that we have a reference, but the main point is we need to work together. I did bring up the sanctity, if you will, of closed session. That's particularly important because if we can't discuss things amongst ourselves, knowing that it's just amongst ourselves, that completely stabs everyone else in the back. It's very disrespectful. So, I want to emphasize that to everyone as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Council Member Bachmer? A motion to approve staff recommendation. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Bachmer and a second by Council Member Bertrand. Any additional council comments? Seeing none, I have a roll call vote, please. Yes. Council Member Bachmer? Aye. Council Member Bertrand? I agree. Council Member Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. And Mayor Peterson? Aye. Great. Thank you. Carried unanimously. Thank you to the staff and council that worked on that. We're going to move on to our final item of the evening, item 8C, onboarding process update. And I'll turn it over to staff. All right. I am going to run the slides here for Chloe. Yes. Thank you, City Manager. And thank you, Mayor and Council. Can you all hear me? Yep. Great. I'm just going to be transparent and let you know that I actually cannot see the screen. So I'm going to be looking at my notes and the City Manager is going to help me run the slideshow. So thank you for your patience with our technology this evening. I'm just going to briefly discuss what staff has suggested and pulled together about the onboarding process for new council members and newly appointed officials for the City of Capitola. So our first slide is going to focus on what's already in in motion and what has been scheduled by staff. The first being um, what we typically have done in the past and what we're doing yet again this year is the candidate orientation, which is a focused presentation um, that's actually happening just in the next few days for all candidates that are running for city council. It's an overview of city operations and really a, a great background on the city of Capitola this will ensure that candidates are well informed on Capitola operations, how we're organized, and the different services that our city offers community members. And the second um, activity that I'm personally looking forward to 
is a training opportunity um, given later this month by the City Clerks Association of California. I'll be attending. Um, it's something I think that perfectly addresses um, the vice mayor's concerns and, and will allow us to learn more about best practices for onboarding newly elected officials and I'll be taking notes and writing everything down, best practices and any you know, good ideas that we can then implement to welcome new members. So moving forward to the next slide, um, these are some suggested activities that staff brainstormed and is presenting to you this evening, the biggest of which is a new council workshop. This would be something that would take place um, early in 2021 in January after the election and after we have our new council, the tentative plan would be to present the council handbook, the newly adopted code of conduct, thank you for that, and also to go over any um, pertinent administrative policies. So what's nice about this is it'll be happening you know, in the future once our, our new council is in place and the mayor at that time can really coordinate with staff to make sure that the agenda for that workshop is to their liking and then addresses all concerns and questions. After that workshop, um, staff would present a similar one that's more targeted for appointed officials. That would also discuss the Brown Act and again, relevant administrative policies for those new members. And then the last two ideas, um, one is to have city attorney one-on-one -on -one meetings for new council members and perhaps council that want a refresher on the very specific role that our city attorney Zutler plays for the city and to be able to ask any questions of her they may have. And then the last is something that I know currently takes place and that would continue into the future, which is the city manager one-on-one -on -one meetings with new council members and current council members um, to make sure that those members feel welcomed and fully informed of what's going on and how the staff and council work together every day. So those are um, really what we're suggesting. That's just an overview of what staff has put in place already and what we think is a great idea moving forward, just so that all new members feel welcome and feel like they can achieve what they are setting out to do so um, in a positive way. So with that, thank you for your time and I'm available to answer any questions, though you may wanna ask the city manager, <laughs> which is fine with me. I'm here if you need me. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions on this item from council? I'm seeing no questions. So we will go to public comments. Is there any public comment on this item? I do not see any attendees uh, and I do not have any emails. All right, with that, I will bring it back to council for a discussion. I believe there's not a vote on this item, correct? We're just providing feedback? That is correct. Okay, all right. Uh, does anyone have any comments on this? Uh, council member Bator. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I think this is a great program. Um, uh, we seem to have a field uh, this year of a lot of new people that will be running for council, and depending on the results, uh, there may not be a lot of background. So I think that this, these type of programs, meetings with the uh, city attorney, meetings with the mayor, uh, the more input that is able to be delivered to them is more helpful for them to get off to a good start. So uh, I, I commend this program. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Botwer. Yeah, I agree. I think this is a great opportunity for us to um, bring people on board in a way that will give them an opportunity to learn as much as they can up front. And I know that uh, programs like the League of Cities also provide um, some great trainings, but I think to have one that's Capitola specific is, is really important. And uh, this is an exciting opportunity. So I wanna, again, thank you. Um, I believe this was also Vice Mayor Brooks who uh, wanted to look into not only the code of conduct but the onboarding process and so thank you for for bringing that up and, and getting this in motion and for uh, our staff um, that, that put together the, these ideas uh council member bertrand um yeah i just uh, wanted to say i feel quite positive about this and uh, it's a great opportunity for all the board members to uh, the new ones and the, the current ones to talk and get to know each other so there's that added uh bit. Great, thank you. 
All right, any additional comments on this item? Seeing none, uh, that was just an information item for us to provide feedback on. It sounds like we're all uh, pretty excited about this uh, opportunity. Uh, and with that, we have reached the end of tonight's agenda. So uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. And as always, please take care of yourselves and take care of each other. And we will see you next time.